Next up, um, we have uh, Esra Al Shafe, um, Tracy Chow, and Deb Roy. And I'll just give them a moment to uh, get added to our spotlight section. Hey, Tracy. Uh, let's grab Esra. We might need you to do your um, camera. There we go. Great. Um, and folks know Esra's, uh, you know, needs to appear uh, pseudo whatever the image form of pseudonymous Lee is. Um, so uh, great, welcome. Um, three really brilliant uh, different projects. And um, I'd love to hear first from Esra on um, what you're up to for a couple of minutes. Sure, we, thank you. Uh, we, actually, give us one minute because let's get the slides up so that uh, folks can see that as well. Great, okay. So okay, folks can see, um, it may be a little difficult, but yeah, there we go. Great, off to the races, go for it. Thank you everyone, um, really thrilled to be here um, describing myself. Um, I've always been represented in the form of a simple avatar, um, physically anonymous on the web due to the sensitive nature of my work, considering the risks involved. So um, I'm from Bahrain, um, the founder of Majal.org, which for the last 15 years has been creating digital platforms that amplify underrepresented and marginalized voices in the Middle East and North Africa. These platforms include Midi's Tunes, which is a web and mobile app for underground musicians in the region who use music as a tool for social justice advocacy. Um, another one is MigrantRights.org, which is a platform for interactive campaigning on the plight of migrant workers in the Gulf region, a segment of the population that is literally enslaved to this day through um, abusive systems and policies that uh, enable it to thrive for the sake of economic gains and power. Um, and then also ahwa.org. Ahwa is the uh, Arabic word for passions. And it's a platform for the Arab queer community that uses gaming mechanics um, to facilitate high quality interactions. So the aim was to reduce the, um, the isolation that comes from extreme anxiety and fear, being a part of a community that is essentially criminalized um, by our governments and our societies. And um, so we use a point system for users to escalate and access various features on the site to help overcome the major obstacle of trolling um, so that users feel a sense of protection and at the same time have incentives to en engage more um, in, a, in a meaningful way on the platform. Thank you. Excited to hear more about, about all of this. Um, all right, uh, Tracy, I believe you're up next. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Tracy. Um, I'm a software engineer, diversity and inclusion act, uh, activist, and founder and CEO of Block Party. So Block Party is a consumer anti-harassment service that aims to give people back control of their online experience. Um, our beta product lets people clean up their Twitter experience by auto-muting users based on configurable filters. Um, so the way it works, as you can see from the illustration graphic, um, it runs continuously in the background to monitor mentions and replies on Twitter and anything that doesn't pass your filters is hidden from Twitter, it's muted. And so using Twitter itself is less noisy and traumatic, but everything that's hidden is also put into a folder on Block Party for later review if necessary. Um, although the immediate pain point we're trying to solve is abuse and harassment, uh, the broader mission is user safety and control. And so we're trying to let people choose what they want to see and engage with and also protect their mental health while acknowledging other important user needs too, like being able to review what's been filtered um, for things that are actually okay or even good. And also for the bad things like real threats that need to be considered. Um, and in terms of product philosophy, Block Party is very much centered on the user and that experience as someone who may be experiencing harassment. Uh, for example, one thing we think is super problematic about the approach of current platforms is that so much of the burden of dealing with abuse is um, falling on the users targeted by it. And so with the design of our product, which puts potentially problematic accounts into a folder on Block Party, we make it possible to delegate access to this folder to friends and helpers who can review and take action on your behalf and you don't have to give them access to your entire Twitter account, for example. Um, 
Another example is thinking through the use case of documentation, which is really important in the cases of abuse. Um, we make it really easy to collect and save that evidence in case you need it later for reporting purposes. As kind of a broader framing point, um, the way our digital society works right now is essentially lawless. Like there's no real standards of governance. Rules, if they exist, are unevenly enforced. Problems like abuse and harassment are almost entirely unchecked. Um, and there's a lot that needs to be done to fix digital society. And that's what this conference is all about. Um, and a lot of really cool ideas uh, about new approaches and new platforms. But the way I'm thinking about Block Party is that while we are fixing and rebuilding, we also need to provide tools to people who are using existing platforms to have a voice. Um, and that's particularly important if you look at the types of people who we most need to hear from and are experiencing disproportionate abuse, um, public servants, journalists, activists, healthcare experts, um, especially those who are women and minorities um, and parts of other marginalized communities. And they are unfortunately some of the most attacked, but also the people that we most need to hear from. Uh, when governance or public infrastructure fails, we simultaneously need to work on fixing those systemic issues while also giving people some private sector solutions to at least mitigate some of the pain or danger uh, in the short term. So maybe an analogy is, is like when um, women might opt to take taxis or Ubers to get home at night if public transit doesn't feel safe. There is a broader safety issue that needs to be solved, but at least there is an alternative that people can access for their private physical security. And uh, Block Party is trying to do that for the internet. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, uh, we have Deb Roy um, speaking about uh, the uh, LVN project. Hi everyone, thanks. I just put a, a link to this project in the, the chat as well. Um, kind of hard to uh, describe in a single picture, but here's uh, my current attempt. Um, the, the idea of the Local Voices Network um, was really motivated by a desire to create um, a new space for underheard voices and perspectives, and in particular to, uh, to be able to surface nuance and complexity that um, we spent an awful lot of time studying social media uh, and mass media um, content where the loudest, most extreme voices dominate. So can we create a new space? And there's really two components to how we're approaching the design of Local Voices Network. Um, to create a, a kind of network of conversations on the technology side, um, the, sort of the job of the, the tech is to help uh, kind of scaffold facilitated dialogue, kind of make it easier for people to be able to actually host um, and record and capture the resulting um, uh, speech that occurs from small group dialogue. Uh, and then to be able to uh, sort of an annotate lift up parts of those recordings and share them uh, between conversations that starts to create a network. Um, and then analytics tools that brings together human listening and machine learning to find and surface patterns across larger collections of conversations. So that's sort of the, the role of the tech. Um, and let's stay on the previous slide for a second and on the, the human side um, to uh, design facilitated dialogue scripts kind of recipes for conversations that really invite the participants that come into these conversations to have agency in, in steering the agenda of the conversations um, and uh, sharing both hopes and concerns about life in, in their communities and um, also linking those hopes and concerns to a lived experience and, and, uh, and, and narratives, um, sort of personal stories and, and experiences. So, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, we we launched this effort, which is essentially um, through a, a kind of community organizing model in Madison, Wisconsin, in uh, 2019, um, where we invited people from communities to uh, learn facilitation practices, learn how to use the technology, which at the time uh, involved a physical device, a, a digital hearth that was in circulation in public libraries. You could check out and gather around the hearth and the hearth would record the conversation upload to the web. And, uh, and then with the pandemic, we switched to Zoom and really saw things uh, scale. And uh, this is, the, if you can't read the, the vertical, sort of uh, tens of thousands of minutes of recorded conversation. We've now had 
participants from 28 states around the country that have participated. So I'll just end by giving you a, a sample of what is starting to happen with um, this effort. So if you just go to the next slide, it's just kind of a, a, a case study. And again, I, I won't be able to do justice to it. Um, so I'll just put one more link here. Um, if you become curious about what happened in Madison, um, there was a um, under a kind of racially charged uh, situation, the previous police chief was forced out um, uh, of his uh, role. And then the Madison Police and Fire Commission announced that they wanted to run the search for the next police chief in a new way and bring the community into the actual selection process. They hosted a series of conversations using the LVN platform. And, um, and then our team uh, combined that, the resulting uh, conversations that they hosted with an archive of hundreds of people at this point who had participated in small dialogues because we launched in Madison in 2019 and use this kind of machine learning plus human listening um, process to synthesize patterns of what we heard relating to community safety and policing. And those are translated into a set of interview questions, several of which were used in the final round of interviews and the, the um, final four candidate interviews um, re responding to those essentially questions sourced from the community were released publicly and used as a basis for selecting the new police chief who was just hired a couple of weeks ago. So we, we see this as an example of a kind of uh, civic infrastructure that we think is scalable, both the human dimension and the, the tech dimension to create uh, sort of a, a new way to bring um, underheard voices into in this point, this a really crucial uh, decision making process. So I'll end there and I'm going to uh, just share one last link in the chat. Um, this, this work was done between Cortico, which is a nonprofit that grew out of uh, MIT. Um, and just earlier uh, this morning, we announced sort of the, the research partner to this um, is the MIT. MIT announced a new Center for Constructive Communication that is working closely uh, with Cortico on advancing the analytics uh, side of this work, but um, some cool stuff happening at MIT related to this that uh, I wanted to plug while I had the floor. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so I want to I want to toss that same question out first, which is um, for each of you, like what what motivated your um, taking this project on? What was the um, what was the driving question, need, circumstance that that led you to to this? So my, I came to be working on Block Party um, with a few different things coming together. One is I. Um, Long time, I'm a long time Silicon Valley person. I was an engineer at a number of the different um, Valley companies at Google, at Facebook. Um, I was at Quora very early and at Pinterest very early. Um, so, as a software engineer at these companies, got to see how they were getting built uh, from the ground up, um, got to participate in a lot of the really core um, product decisions around what content gets distributed. Um, what moderation tools look like. In fact, I built some of the earliest moderation tools for Quora because I was already getting harassed. Um, even when I just first started and we only had a couple thousand users and so started building these tools out of personal need. Um, kind of simultaneous to this work as an engineer, I've also done quite a bit around diversity and inclusion activism, which has come out of my experiences being um, a woman in, in tech and being a minority in that regard and seeing how the lack of diversity and inclusion representation on teams leads to oversight and just uh, forgetting about things that are quote unquote edge cases that are actually quite big cases that are, are very real things like abuse and harassment. Um, but when teams don't have folks that experience uh, abuse and harassment, they don't think it's that important. Um, and obviously there's much broader implications for the lack of diversity than that as well. Um, but then kind of ironically from my diversity work, um, I built more of a platform for myself using Twitter primarily as uh, the, the channel to reach people around activism. And I get quite a bit of abuse and harassment um, because of that. So I counted it up. It's, it's been at least 15 years of dealing with online harassment, but it's been much worse over the last few years. Um, and so a big part of my 
uh, wanting to work on tools like Blog Party is just to help myself. Um, I feel very lucky to be at the intersection of having the experiences and skills, having been, been an engineer at platform companies, and kind of knowing how they operate and how they make decisions and um, where some of the gaps are, and also being the target customer of the product that we're building and experiencing harassment and figuring out what is actually useful. Thank you. Um, Deb, would love to hear what motivated you to get into Cortico and local voices. Well, I've had a pretty long history of analyzing social media and we did a big effort around the 2016 presidential election, analyzing Twitter, um, commentary about the election. We partnered with the Commission for Presidential Debates and tried to translate tweets into questions for a, a different job interview. Um, so th some of the questions put to, to Trump and Clinton during the presidential debate were sourced from Twitter data. And, you know, after that was all over, and, and really by the time we were halfway through the 2016 cycle, um, it was clear to our team that something pretty dramatic was shifting just in, we weren't trying to predict outcomes, but the um, uh, uh, the level of, um, uh, well, I'll just say after the election, we did two big studies, one which was just really revealing of how fragmented um, the network looked and uh, was really in, you know, kind of a, we could see the um, underlying, in some ways, root causes of, uh, you know, enabling conditions for polarization and then add information. We did a big study of how false news spreads uh, through social media. Um, but as we're looking at all of this up close, um, the question is, well, you could study the problem and you could see, for example, um, othering at work, uh, just the caricatures of other groups and the inability for the more nuanced and complex narratives to to make it across divides, just the medium itself is not inviting. Um, and um, so that was sort of part one. Part two, I'll just be more brief. We, uh, I met someone named Kathy Kramer, a professor at University of Madison, Wisconsin. She had just published a book based on a decade of field work uh, in 2016 called The Politics of Resentment. Um, and uh, the subtext of the subtitle was um, uh, Rural Consciousness, Understanding how radically different the worldview of uh, Wisconsinites in rural Wisconsin are from uh, uh, Kathy's uh, understanding of, of very similar topics uh, from Madison. And um, uh, I learned from her about her methods of just inviting herself into coffee clutches in the wild um, and asking open-ended questions and, and hearing people who know one another talk about topics, but knowing that there's an outsider that they've invited in. And, uh, and then her, uh, her methods for systematic listening, and then writing a book that explained things uh, in very plain terms that um, were eye openers for me in terms of how different uh, of a viewpoint there can be. Um, and, uh, and we sense that no matter how many tweets and how many billions of pieces of content from, you know, we would scrape from different sources, there were insights that Kathy was able to relay that we weren't. And so we uh, asked the question, how do we scale these methods that um, Kathy opened up a window? And there was, you know, both her listening, but also can we create a kind of network effect uh, so we can decentralize the roles being played there centrally by Kathy, both um, of listening uh, and of sharing, uh, you know, across divides, and um, and so Kathy became a, a critical collaborator, and um, we started to test and iterate um, with different, and you know, we're still it's our, still early days, but um, it was no accident that that case study I just shared was played out in Madison, uh, which is Kathy's hometown, um, and so she. Um, rolled up her sleeves and uh, helped organize the, the launch in 2019, uh, working with the, the Cortico team. But um, it was really just trying to make sense of yeah. problems we could see. But uh, when people would say, all right, well, if it's not racism, Deb, what is it? If it's not, if there's not a simple answer to some of the um, things you're seeing in the data, then, then what? Um, and we realized we had no clue. <laughs> that it was, it was complicated in ways that we were stuck in our own. To use a term I think you've heard 
Eli. We're stuck in our own bubble. Thank you. Well, um, I'm so, so appreciative of all three of these efforts, and I wish we could um, talk about them a bit more. There's a lot more to get into, but we'll have to do that another time. Thank you so much for sharing um, and for what you're doing. Um, and um, let's uh, do our un unmiking and cheering uh, for those efforts. Thank you so much.